Okay, so welcome to the last lecture on marine biology. This one we're going to wrap it up and kind of pull together all these ideas about marine biology and look at the impacts of humans on the marine environment. So we need humans up here. What are we doing? What are we doing to the ocean, to the marine ecosystem? How are we doing things here in the Midwest, in central Illinois, or hundreds or even thousands of miles away from the ocean? How are we doing things here that impact the ocean? And then what are the consequences of those actions? How do they come back to affect or influence us, even though the ocean is very, very far away? So that's what we want to explore here and look at some, some small things each of us can do that will make a big difference collectively. Okay, so one of the biggest things we're doing to the ocean is the modification and destruction of various marine habitats. So most habitat destruction occurs close to the shoreline, occurs close to land. So you think about it, this is primarily due to human development. All right, what are we doing when we develop resorts, we put up houses, we do these things that require us to modify the marine ecosystem. Even if it's a shoreline, we're influencing and saying, well, let's bulldoze those mangroves to make way for a subdivision or a shrimp farm or whatever it may be. So we're definitely impacting the marine habitats significantly. And this tends to be more acute in developing countries. Okay, countries that are trying to reach a developed status they're looking at how can we improve our economy, grow more resources, provide basic services to our citizens. That's the challenge. Developing countries don't have the luxury and the lifestyle that we have in the United States. And I know plenty of people here who are struggling, but when you compare it to somebody in a developing country that makes maybe $15 a day for an eight-hour day of work, there's a huge difference. So developing countries are, again, trying to develop the resources to provide for their citizens. And that often comes with destruction of habitat or alteration of habitats. Now, it's hypocritical for us to say, oh, don't destroy that reef or those mangroves, because look what we've done to our country. How, many, how much native prairie is left, how much native forests, and so on. So we don't want to be hypocrites. We just want to look at individually and personally what can we do that would hopefully minimize some of this destruction in these other environments. So our focus primarily is what's going on with the coral reefs. So the destruction of the coral reefs is a huge concern. Approximately one-fourth or 25% of all coral reefs have been destroyed or at risk of destruction. You know, they're, they're at that stage where they're going to be collapsing very soon if they haven't already. And it's estimated one-third or about 33% of reef-building coral species face extinction in the near future. That's a lot. Now, some of the main things that are leading to this issue or causing this issue are things like habitat destruction. Okay, this is what we were just talking about. Destroy the habitat, got some problems. Pollution. Pollution is a big problem. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Rising global temperatures. It is happening. Temperatures go up, ocean gets warmer, those little zoanthellae that are inside the corals, they don't like warmer waters, they leave. That causes the corals to die. The ocean acidification. More carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. CO2 gets sucked into the ocean, bonds with the water, forms carbonic acid, breaks apart into what's called a bicarbonate ion. Basically, the ocean is getting more acidic. The pH is lowering and going down, which means it's more acidic. That creates huge problems and significant stress on marine species. Anything that requires calcium, corals, a lot of the invertebrates, even a lot of those algaes that are 
calcium, have that calcium in them to make them crunchy and hard. Things like the merman shaving brush and some of those other algaes are all getting stressed because of acidification in the ocean. And in some parts of the world, fishing is done with explosives. They actually, a little bit of dynamite, throw it in, boom! Here come all the fish. They come floating up because they're stunned or outright killed. But what about all the things that also got hit with those explosions? And the aquarium trade, or we could say the aquarium slash pet trade, is also playing a role in the destruction and the decline of coral reefs. Okay, so these are all things that we're going to talk about and look at and figure out how can we personally decrease our influence. Okay, so the goal is thinking about <clears throat> what we can do personally to decrease our impact. All right, so let's take a look at things that are happening. One way that the ocean is being altered and habitat destruction occurs is through a fishing practice known as trawling. So trawling boats throw out these huge nets. I mean, they're half an acre wide, and we're talking hundreds of thousands of feet wide, and drops to the bottom of the ocean, and drags along the bottom. So you can see in the little picture here, the trawling net is dragging across the bottom, and everything that was here in this area here is either caught in the net, or it's been scraped up, and a lot of times it gets killed, it gets destroyed. Trawling is the fishing industry's version of clear-cutting a forest. So it scrapes the bottom of the ocean clean. And the problem with trawling, one of the huge issues here, is all this stuff called bycatch. All this unwanted stuff that they catch, well, we don't need it. Let's just pitch it back in. Let's throw it back in. So here's all the bycatch. Most of the time that stuff dies. It, it's so stressed or so injured and damaged during the collection, it dies. So now they waste all this bycatch while they're destroying the bottom of the ocean to catch certain species. So it, it is amazing the damage that can occur due to trawling. So again, questions are, when you eat fish, are you eating fish that were caught in a sustainable fashion, or are you eating fish that were caught by trawling? So, all right, marine pollution. Pollution is the human introduction of a substance that reduces the quality of the environment. Okay, so it alters the environment, changes the environment. So you guys saw the very first photo. Think about the pollution that was washing up on Glover's Atoll. That was a picture from Glover's, the Glover's Atoll in Belize there. Look at the fishing line and the net here that's tangled around that poor sea turtle. That's pollution. Okay, so humans are a source of pollution. So the main sources of pollution include fertilizers, sewage, oil, and persistent toxic substances. Okay, things that don't go away. <clears throat> so as we talk about pollution here, we're going to look at various forms and again try to identify are you contributing to any of these forms of pollution? How can we reduce that? How can we minimize that? So, okay, so fertilizers. <clears throat> Anything put on land, land-based fertilizers, whether it's your backyard, it's the golf course, or it's a farm field in the Midwest, a lot of these fertilizer, fertilizers eventually wash into streams and rivers and then eventually make their way down to the coastal areas. So we look at this and go, okay, every fertilizer that is sprayed, if there's a heavy rain afterwards, that washes out, that washes down, downstream. So here's downstream eventually making its way into the ocean. Now when all these fertilizers and pesticides and things hit the gulf here, they start to have an impact, significant impact. I mean, along the journey, more and more is accumulating. 
So there's this increase or building of pollution as it gets closer to the ocean. Once it hits the ocean, it often contributes to this thing called eutrophication. Now eutrophication, increase in nutrients. So fertilizer, hey, that helps make plants grow, makes algae grow, makes the producer base explode, which seems like a great thing. But the problem is, as the producer base goes up, it sucks out a lot of the oxygen. As this larger producer base eventually dies off, which is going to happen, just natural cycling, the organic material, as that dies off and decomposes, pulls the oxygen out of the water. So you have this decrease in oxygen content due to the decomposition that's happening as a result of eutrophication. Now mobile animals, they scoop their way out of that environment. They leave, they move, they relocate. Animals that are not as mobile, they die. They can't get out of there. Oxygen leaves, they suffocate, they die, adds more dead decomposing material to the environment, more oxygen is pulled out as that decomposes, and it leads to a collapsing of the system. So the challenge, the problem here, when we look at eutrophication, the Gulf of Mexico, what's known as the hypoxic zone, this eutrophication zone, oh, let me get to the green, is getting larger and larger every year. It's extending further and further out, and it is lasting longer and longer and longer. Eventually the tides move it out, and the ocean currents pull away all of that deoxygenated water and the dead organic material. But eventually it's gonna reach a point where there's so much pollution going in that that dead zone stays there. So the ripple effect here, let's talk about shrimp. If you're a fisherman and you're trying to catch shrimp and you used to be able to go three miles offshore to catch them, now you have to take your boat seven or eight miles offshore. That means more fuel, more time, more cost, which then eventually returns the cost back to the consumer, which means our shrimp dinners get more expensive because of fertilizer being used in the Midwest that eventually makes its way to the ocean, contributing to eutrophication. Connections. That's what I want you guys really to pick up with this last chapter here. How are we impacting the ocean? All right, now sewage. Ugh, sewage pollution. We got domestic sewage, which comes from stormwater. Okay, so this is just runoff from our roofs, from our parking lots, from our garages, from our houses. Sewage discharge. You know, it goes to the municipal treatment plant, and that gets discharged into the river. That eventually makes its way to the ocean. And then we have industrial sewage from factories. All right, so think about industries. What are the regulations on sewage treatment in different factories? Sometimes those are not as strong as they should be. Depending on EPA, sometimes those restrictions or those regulations are removed, and now factories can discharge sewage directly into water systems. So the challenge is what is in the sewage. A lot of times heavy metals, toxins, and disease-causing organisms are found in sewage. So anything that goes down a toilet into a waste treatment plant may wind up in the ocean. It depends on if it breaks down and it biodegrades. A lot of medicines we take go through our body, don't get broken down, they wind up in the water, eventually they make their way to the ocean. Birth control is a perfect example. When a woman takes the pill, the hormonal birth control, her body doesn't break it down. It winds up in the toilet. It winds up in the stream. It winds up in the ocean. And this is influencing everything in the aquatic ecosystem.
All right, so we've talked about a few different things here. In the next lecture, we're going to look at other forms of pollution.